So now we have a basic understanding of how to use the periodic table in order to determine number of protons, neutrons and electrons in each atom. We can now look at how each of those particles arrange themselves. So the first thing to understand is that protons and neutrons sit in the centre of an atom. They form what's called the nucleus. So all of the particles with any relative mass sit in the centre or the nucleus of the atom. And the electrons are positioned on the outside. They essentially orbit the nucleus of the atom. Now what we're interested in here is how those electrons arrange themselves. And what they do is they arrange themselves into shells or energy levels. So some of those electrons will position themselves close to the nucleus, which means they're tightly bonded or tightly attracted to the protons. And then some of those electrons will begin to arrange themselves further and further away from the nucleus. The further away they get from the nucleus, the less attraction there is pulling them towards the centre, because positive and negative attract each other. So to repeat, the electrons that are near the centre are held tightly, and the electrons that are further away are more freely able to move or leave the atom, as it were. So as we look at the periodic table, I'm just going to refer to the first three rows. In the centre here, we have some transition metals, which are a little bit more complicated, in white. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the first three rows. So that first row, with hydrogen, is the home for atoms with only one shell. And I'll just put one S for now. And the second row with lithium is the home for atoms with two shells. And sodium, this row here, is for atoms with three shells. And by shells, I mean energy levels. And we'll see what this means in a moment. So hydrogen and helium only have one shell with electrons. Lithium, beryllium, all the way through to neon have two shells. And sodium through to argon have three shells. So let's take a look at a couple of these. So we've said that hydrogen has an atomic number of one, therefore it has one proton. But it also has an atomic mass of one. Therefore, because the number of protons plus the number of neutrons equals one, there can't be any neutrons. And we've also said if there's one proton, there must be one electron because the charges need to balance. So the electronic configuration for hydrogen is very straightforward. It's just one. If we move on to helium, now we've said that helium has an atomic number of two, so we know that it's got two protons, but it has an atomic mass of four, so it must also have two neutrons. Those two numbers need to add up to four. And if it's got two protons, it must have two electrons. So the electronic configuration for helium is just two. When we move on to lithium, We've said that lithium has an atomic number of three, so it must have three protons. And we've said in the majority of cases, it has an atomic mass of seven, so it must have four neutrons. And if it's got three protons, we also know that it's got three electrons. Those three electrons, as we've just said, are arranged over two energy levels. And so the way that we write this is two of those electrons go on the inside energy level and one goes on the outside. Beryllium, therefore, with four electrons, would be two, two, and so on. And we'll look at a few more of these in a moment. If we want to represent that hydrogen atom, and we want to look at what's happening with that electron, then the way that we would do that is as follows. We would have our nucleus, one proton, no neutrons, and it has one electron in the first energy level, like so. We could represent that as a dot or a cross, but when we start to look at chemical reactions, two atoms reacting together, we represent one with a dot and one with a cross, so we can see how those electrons are interacting. And we'll move on to that in a later tutorial. If we look at lithium next, we've said that lithium, it needs a bigger nucleus, because inside that nucleus it has three protons and four neutrons, and we also know that it has three electrons. It's going to have two electrons on the inside shell, we'll represent them with a dot this time, and it has one electron in the second shell, like so. Now what we know for the periodic table for those first three rows is the maximum electrons that can go on an inside shell is two. 
But this shell here has a maximum of two. And our second shell here has a maximum of eight. So let's look at some of the atoms where there's more electrons in those energy levels. Let's look at fluorine. Well, fluorine has an atomic number of nine. So we know that it's got nine protons. But it has an atomic mass of 19. Well, if it's got an atomic mass of 19, it must have 10 neutrons because those two add up to 19. And if it's got nine protons, it must have nine electrons. We know that the most we can have on the inside shell is two. Therefore, the remaining seven are going to go on the second shell. Fluorine's in that second row, so we know it can only have two shells or two energy levels. Fluorine then has nine protons, 10 neutrons. It has a full first shell, maximum of two, and its second shell has seven. I'm just going to draw a partial shell here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And let's also look at argon. Argon's an interesting case because argon has 18 protons. It has an atomic number of 18. It has 22 neutrons because the atomic mass is 40 and it has 18 electrons. To make up 18, we have two and eight, which is 10. And in our third shell, we're going to have eight. So let's sketch argon. We've got 18 protons, we've got 22 neutrons, we've got two in the first shell, we'll go for dots this time, we've got eight in the second shell, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and in our third shell, we've also got eight. Like so. Now, it wouldn't be until we got to the next row where we'd introduce a fourth shell. And if you have a look, potassium has an atomic number of 19. Therefore, potassium has 19 protons. It must also have 19 electrons. And the way that those 19 electrons would be arranged is 2, and 8 is 10, and 8 is 18, and 1 in the fourth shell. So if we disregard our transition metals, Let's go back to our periodic table. If we disregard our transition metals, which are in the centre here, then the number of electrons in each shell is two on the inside shell and then eight on each subsequent shell. So we know that all of these in the left-hand column only have one electron in their outer shell because the electronic configuration of hydrogen is just one of lithium is 2, 1, of sodium is 2, 8, 1, and so on. And if we go all the way to the other side, we have this column here, where they all have 7 in their outer shell. We have fluorine, which is 2, 7. We have chlorine, which is 2, 8, 7, and so on. And the far right-hand column here, we have helium, with an electronic configuration of 2, neon with an electronic configuration of 2, 8, argon with 2, 8, 8, and so on. Now what this means is our far left column with hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and rubidium, what they really want to do is lose electrons. They want to lose that electron on the outside. It makes the atom more stable. And on the right hand side, or the column with fluorine, chlorine, and bromine in, all of those elements or all of those atoms are desperate to collect electrons. The goal really is to complete that outer shell. So on the one hand, we've got atoms that desperately want to lose electrons. On the other hand, we've got electrons that desperately want to gain them. And this is kind of the basis for some of the chemical reactions that we're going to see in the next video. But if we look at the column helium, neon, argon, krypton, they have a complete outer shell. They don't want to gain electrons and they don't want to lose electrons. And that's why those are called our noble gases. They're inert, they don't react, they're highly unreactive materials. So now we can begin to see how the number of electrons in the outer shell 
affect how reactive different materials are, and we're going to explore this in a bit more detail in the next video.